Good day. Welcome to the expert dialogue city spaces with British accent, offered to you by United Kingdom Department for International Trade in Russia. We have invited Natalia Trunova to our studio. She is the vice president of the Center for Strategic Research Foundation, the head of spatial development department. We will also listen to representatives of British companies who are going to present their cases, as well as Brusnika company. <laughs> Natalia, hello. Good day, Ekaterina. Good day, dear listeners and participants. Indeed, judging by the presentations which I have already seen, which was sent to me by Ekaterina, indeed we will have an interesting discussion, the future of the series after the pandemic has been discussed during the last months a lot. We can already see that many countries are facing the second wave of the pandemic and the next step of the constraints. However, the experts who are working with the economies of the cities and the experts on architecture and development, as well as planning, are rather optimistic about the future. And if we take a look at the report by Wesser published recently, we can see that the crisis affected cities due to the pandemic are rather harsh. We are talking about increasing unemployment, decreasing of the incomes and, of course, taxation foundation for the next year, especially if we are talking about touristic cities or the cities which were working with a lot of uh, business contacts and tourist exchange problems. Many experts state that this is only temporary, we need to make our cities more resilient and sustainable, they have to be protected against various threats, and the main areas which are going to be developed in the cities are first green technologies, involving creating new green spaces and bringing life to the existing ones, introducing natural elements to the artificial elements existing in our city spaces. Secondly, smart cities, and right now it's one of the key areas for Russian cities. We are implementing the Smart City project, supervised by the Ministry of Construction, Housing and Utilities of the Russian Federation. And third, becoming more inclusive to have even more social groups, social categories, to make the city spaces to be more open to all the categories of citizens. And today we will see the view presented by English architects on this matter. We have an absolutely great lineup here. The companies which need no additional introduction, like Zaha Hadid Architects, Gillespie's, Scott Brownrig, and Acom Russia, as well as Russian development company Brusnika, which is going to present a project involving the best technological solutions existing now. They also received the excellent score from Briam. So let us start our broadcast, our discussion, and we will start with Christos Passes from Zaha Hadid Architects. Christos, hello. Okay, thank you very much for uh, for the welcoming. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here today and uh, to once again be able to participate in uh, in one of uh, these wonderful and uh, and uh, and interesting uh, events that are being prepared by the 
uh, Department of International Trade in Moscow, and uh, I, I'm a true believer in in the in the cultural and 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 business exchange between countries and between uh, between markets, because I think this is this is one of the things that uh, helps us to understand each other and and to also share and contribute. Uh, experiences and to gain knowledge. So, uh, my name is is Christos Passas. I'm a design director at Zaha Hadid Architects, and uh, I am also the head of the in my company for for the Russian region and the and the SIS. So today, I would like to take the opportunity to present to you a few of the projects that we uh, that we have done in in Russia in recent uh, in recent years, and uh, I would like to start. First of all, with um, uh, with the project we have, uh, we are doing. We are currently doing. It's currently under construction for uh, uh, Sperbank. This project is a techno park. It is in Skolkovo, and it occupies a rather large site, um, which uh, in a way uh, uh, helps to. Uh, to to kind of agglomerate the, uh, the the different facilities and the developments that are happening in in Skolkovo at the moment. So, um, as you're looking at the project, um, I think you're looking at a building that is relatively long. It's about 300 meters long in, in the one direction and 150 meters deep. So, in London standards, this this project is the size of one neighborhood. So, we overlaid the plan of this building. Uh, in uh, over Clerkenwell, where in the area where our company is, and we saw that inside we could fit a clinic, we could fit a primary school, we could fit a kindergarten, we could fit a park, we could fit a bunch of offices and residential areas. So, uh, in dealing with with a project like this, our idea was to offer the organization of Sperbank a very progressive and and uh, alternative take on the design of workspaces. And these ideas are revolving basically around the idea of improving staff engagement. Recent studies have shown that 70% of all staff uh, that working in, in companies across Europe and, and in Russia and in the United States are actually bored of their work. And, and the reason for that is the routine, is the, is the repetition, is the mundane kind of day in and day out of, of the environment. And of course, we recognize that as humans, we are changing human beings. We, we, we have different moods and different feelings and different also thoughts during the day. So an environment that's good for one of our days is not necessarily good for, for another one. So this building is developed as an ecology uh, of, of workspaces. Sorry, um, I go back. Uh, an ecology of workspaces that allows the company to obtain a degree of transparency and see through visibility from side to side. So it's a it's an open plan office, but at the same time, it allows nesting in in different zones and in different areas by means of uh, circularly packed furniture that allows the different project teams within the overall organization to concentrate and to have different degrees of privacy or exposure to the overall uh, to the overall uh, population of of the organization and uh, there's going to be 17,000 people working here in some cases 17,000 people population demand the mayor and a, and a city council in this case it's a it's a private organization so the degree of infrastructure and uh, and organization that needs to go into this is is quite high I appreciate that I don't have a lot of time also so just giving some headlines here rather than a more detailed uh, uh, you know, presentation on the project, which I would love to do in a, in another occasion. A second project that we have recently won in Russia, this is in Yekaterinburg, and it is the Sverdlovsk Philharmonic Hall. The Sverdlovsk Philharmonic Hall was a project that was designed in, in 1910. And after the revolution, by, until 1936, it was uh, a sort of uh, a club 
for business people of the of the Ural region, and then it was donated to the city and became the house, the home of the of the Sverdlovsk Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, which is one of the most world-renowned kind of organizations with beautiful uh, groups of musicians and stuff. So. We participated in this competition to design uh, to design a building that would be essentially an extension of that of that old cluster of buildings, but also offer uh, a kind of a a new uh, take on the future of uh, of these uh, of these uh, music groups. And uh, as you can see, here is the existing building of the Philharmonic. There is a, a 600 people auditorium inside there, which has its problems. So what we wanted to offer was a form and a building that would basically allow the, the existing, the, the old building, let's say, to stay as a foreground, as a facade for, uh, for this new constellation and the new building to become some sort of void, some emptiness, drawing people uh, kind of inside. So the the form of the building is developed as a as a drop or as a as a as a as a wing of a plane. It has this uh, wing section, and the auditorium is sitting inside here. So as people are coming in through, they're going underneath the 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 concert hall and enter into the realm of the of the auditorium. The concert hall is seen to be clad all out of wood to improve acoustics. It's very highly sculpted. And the sculptural uh, design is driven purely by acoustics, so that the reflectivity of the band uh, against the back wall, so that the sound propagates forward, the installation of the choir, the vineyard design, all of these elements are providing kind of reflectors uh, and dispersers of, of sound for optimum non-engineering assisted uh, uh, acoustic performance. Um, there is a second auditorium here, in which case, which opens itself out to the garden, the Wiener Garden, uh, that is one of the most uh, traditional gardens and public spaces in uh, in Yekaterinburg. And of course, we are uh, what we are suggesting here is to open up a window back into the city, so that people from the outside can see the performances on the inside, but also from the inside, one can witness the changing of the seasons, winter, spring, summer, uh, and autumn all over again, so that every performance uh, becomes a unique, uh, a unique setting. A third project that I would like to propose here to to show uh, the kind of work and involvement that we've had in the in in Russia is a competition design proposal for the Ruplevo Arkhangelsko uh, territory. Uh, there was a competition a couple of years ago um, that required a design for these. Uh, piece of land, which is basically a marsh. And, uh, and it, is, it is a site that was considered many times before, but it has some very good and key assets. First of all, it has a, a, a waterway uh, that is linked to, to the Moscow River. And, uh, we, uh, and the client thought that this could be developed as a kind of a, a, a water uh, sports facility area. There is also a lot of ecology along the banks of the river here, and the city plan that we're proposing is stepping back and away from the embankment so that the, the, the area remains green. And of course, using smart facilities, the latest tech uh, to propose a 3D urbanism that allows us to look at buildings, not just private units, private properties, but actually as uh, you know, inventory of the cities itself, uh, and therefore they become much more open and much more permeable and accessible by the public. So each and every building can be a piece of the city uh, and it can have private or public residences, it can have parks, and it can have also uh, hotels uh, within within its other form. So every every building is no more one or another function they're actually all mixed use and and actually not so private if i could call it that, like that by and I, I mean that in in quotes of course but that they are they are uh, you know pieces of 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 the city landscape 
<coughs> some other aspects of the same uh, of the same design here we're looking at areas where the buildings become much lower large um, windows on on all the buildings to allow the visibility and the activity of the city to be seen throughout uh, and also uh, developing uh, smart uh, streets for for smart traffic uh, bicycle ways wide uh, sidewalks etc but also cover against the rain or the, or the snow and generally working with all the climatic characteristics to develop a scheme that may uh, you know look have different futures of course and this is one of the futures but it can have it can have a certain uh, fixed criteria and the last uh, project that I would like to to show you uh, based on on again our recent work this is a competition uh, win for uh, the Klenovi Boulevard metro station uh, there was uh, an announcement recently we're very delighted to be uh, to be uh, selected to develop the station because this is uh, our attempt to propose a new style for the Moscow metro stations. Of course, the Moscow metro stations are world renowned and, you know, thinking about uh, the, the palaces of the people who uh, are running through these, this infrastructure day in and day out. It's the, it's, the, it's the system that basically makes the whole city move and tick. And, and we believe that, uh, and we, we researched all the past uh, kind of stations and uh, we develop here a, a proposal that allows the stations to have a lot more light, to be a lot more transparent, uh, intuitively designed so that the need for, for signages and so on are, are minimized. And of course, keeping uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Soviet branding of the, of the metro station as its key, as its key symbol, because uh, we love this, this M so much but the station the inside design becomes much more fluent much more uh, transparent and easy to uh, to meander across the way we've done this design is that we took the platform and uh, uh, there were a series of preset columns because the, uh, the the company the operator the metro station operator builds the stations as prefab brigaded units or let's say pre-designed and and installed units and the architects are asked to develop interior design solutions so what we wanted to do was to take the structure and develop a, a set of cladings on the station that is uh, pointed like an arrow uh, and it points on the two uh, entrances and exits to the station here so it's a it's a bi-directional uh, you know line and by means of the orientation of these columns we're beginning to suggest where is the center of the station versus where are the exits so there is a directionality that is implicit within the station it allows us to uh, help the, the users to find their way very uh, very easily at the same time that we're creating a very uh, smooth and clean design that that uh, declutters basically the station from unnecessary uh, visual noise uh, and uh, uh, another layer is of course the the idea of the of the lighting that is a, a repetitive series of uh, you know almost like ring shaped uh, uh, profiles along the station that as you go toward the center they increase intensity and as you go toward the edges it decreases intensity the role of the of the lighting is not just to light the building but also it begins to pulsate uh, gently uh, a few uh, moments before the train arrives so that it can alert the passengers of the of the incoming train uh, and prepares the passengers. So it's a it's a station based on intuition, fluidity, lightness, but also the anticipation of of passenger movements to simplify uh, the the kind of the visual and the audio uh, signals that one gets inside there, and hopefully makes that more uh, comfortable for the for the passengers. And uh, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And could you please tell us what elements of the architectural projects provide sustainability, which we are discussing today? I'm not sure how to answer this question, to be honest. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, many different uh, architectural elements can offer sustainability, but I think I think the the main point is to to have uh, you know human oriented design to to consider the materials to consider the, the production as much as the ecological and the renewable energy aspects of the of the projects these days. Which Russian project is most significant for you now? Well, all the projects that we, we've shown are important. We, we don't really separate ones, but the, the, the Techno Park project is obviously a flagship project that uh, showcases a lot of new technologies in, in workspace. The Glenovi Boulevard. Uh, metro station is also a very promising new project that uh, that hopes to change the experience of of travelers within Moscow metro stations and provide a kind of a next generation uh, approach and environment for for how we move through infrastructure and uh, and of course also the the Philharmonic Hall in Yekaterinburg is a is a primary uh, cultural project for us and, and we are paying attention to uh, to each one of them uh, separately and together so that we can deliver uh, the best that we can uh, bringing along with us the uh, the best experts from around the world but also trying to push the boundaries of of, of what can be done in in buildings uh, in in Russia as we do everywhere else and and uh, and it's important to uh, to deliver these projects also in a in a good way together with with our Russian colleagues, uh, because we think that this is a kind of experiment uh, that must uh, that must succeed. And I think all of us here, the whole panel of what I see, Darren and Dimitri and Katerina and Carolina, are all uh, in this in this business of trying to improve uh, architectural practice and and the quality. Of, of buildings uh, so that we can improve living standards and we can continue to to have competent cities that are that are adaptable and and uh, and uh, you know of, of good quality for the future uh, thank you Christos uh, we will move to our next uh, presentation thank you very much it was very interesting and uh, uh, hope we'll continue our cooperation. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. I'm sure we will. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Nice to see you all today. And good luck for the next presentations. Bye bye. Bye. Now we give floor to Darren Kamba from Scott Browning. Darren, so. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Kamba. I'm the chief executive of Scott Browning. We're an architectural firm based across the globe. We've got eight offices and we have been working in Moscow now for 10 years. We've completed um, 107 projects now in across Russia. So we, we understand the dynamics. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is really sustainable cities. And, and what does that mean? And the fact that it isn't one dimensional, there are three aspects to sustainability, be it social, economic or environmental. And the current situation clearly that we find ourselves in, that we have a responsibility, <coughs> excuse me, as architects really to look at what is the future of the city. So th this first um, just example, this is one of the largest projects we're working on in Moscow at the moment, it's Skolkova Business Park. And this is part of a whole new region that's developing outside of the MCAD. And, and it, it really brings together so many different things because you've got everything from business to residential to golf courses to uh, learning environments. Everything is, is really in one district. So this really is an example of how cities can decentralize and respond to different needs and provide different things. And it provides a richness to a city. But I'm going to start off with just looking at where we are right now and what, what does that mean for our cities. So back in March, we developed a 10-year plan to look at how responsive environments could uh, battle, if you like, the contagion uh, aspect of the uh, pandemic globally. And the 10-point plan that we put together on, on the left there, I won't go into it in all detail today, but there are one or two specifics that I'll talk about just that relate to the city as, as such. Uh, but what this has done is what we've 
have determined is that so many organizations have wanted to work with us, be they other architects, but, but not just in the built environment. Uh, Formula One teams have joined in with us and all sorts of people to, to look at how we could develop a more sustainable future. And the readership that we have now is currently 350 million people worldwide from Scott Brownrigg. So we know that it's making a difference. It's engaging in terms of uh, the narrative of how we deal with sustainable cities. And there isn't one silver bullet that, that solves all of this, but certainly transport is one of the biggest factors. So reconnecting with the city, first you have to get to the city. And what we've seen with our cities is there's been a, a gradual shift to living with what's around me. So what's on my doorstep? Why go to the city? And that's one of the really key things. But the other thing is actually getting to the city effectively. And mass rapid transport, for all the reasons that we understand now, is less acceptable. And we're seeing that people just don't want to travel into cities. So we have to address this. We can't just ignore it because cities will struggle for some time otherwise uh, in a hugely economic sense. One of the things our cities clearly also lack are tourism. So tourism in any city is fundamental to the success and the growth and the vibrancy. And people want to be in cities with people around them. When cities are empty of tourists, they're very, very different places. And you can see there by the figures, 95% of all air travel is, um, is absent at the moment. So people aren't traveling to our cities. And the image that you see there at the bottom there is our design for Heathrow Airport. So the extension of Heathrow Airport that we were working on right up until March, until it's now put, uh, been put um, on hold for the time being. But you think about that, only 5% are, are traveling in the air. So how do we deal with that? How do we get confidence back to people in the air? And how does that then come into our cities? So we have a company called the Digital Twin Unit. What it does, it does exactly that. It builds digital twins of environments or buildings um, or whole cities. And what that can do is provide predictive analysis of airports to show how you can get through an airport seamlessly and actually safely, and that's the key thing. And it does it in this way. It's mathematically uh, calculated. It, it works out how pathogens travel in airspaces. And the bottom image you see there is our design for uh, um, Istanbul National Airport, which is the largest airport in the world. And we already were doing that before the times that we see ourselves in now. So that building can be shut down or opened up depending on how um, pathogens might be moving through the spaces. Um, but in many respects, the mass rapid transport is the success to kickstarting our economies again, but it is potentially one of the weakest links. So we I don't have to perhaps go into this morning, but it is something that we do have to have very much on our agenda. It's all very well having fantastic stations, but if people feel unsafe to travel through them, then we won't see the vibrancy back into our cities. And indeed, this is our own studio. So this is in Covent Garden. We've taken all of the work out of our reception area, and now we're hanging our bikes in there because people prefer to travel under their own steam rather than um, coming in on uh, transport. So a very, very different way that we're working. So we've adapted uh, to how we work. And as a chief executive, I always dreamt of having my own car space um, with my plaque in front of it. I never thought I'd actually have my own bike space, uh, which mine's the white one uh, just on the front there. So we've adapted and I think that's the key thing. So coming to then to our cities, how will they evolve? So the predictions are that up until Christmas at least, there will only be a 20% occupancy in the city of London, which is absolutely staggering. And when you go into the city of London at the moment, it's very, very quiet. And the financial districts of other major cities are seeing that. But we need to take a global view of how we encourage people back into the cities. There's short wins that you can do, but what we're competing with in the pandemic is we are competing with localism. So the idea of I can travel 15 minutes from my front door and I've got everything around me creates what you have as a local culture. And that's to be encouraged, but cities now have to compete with that. So we have to look at ways to address that. And if you look back historically, uh, certain pandemics of the past, like plague or cholera, 
uh, they changed our cities very much through sanitation, better sanitation came in. But COVID isn't like that. COVID is uh, in ski resorts. It it's, has a very, very different uh, aspect to it. And it doesn't work on the principle of density. So our cities aren't at fault. It's how do we get confidence for people uh, to come back to them? And one of those elements is something we wrote um, about a year ago now, which looks at big data emerging um, and how can uh, economic success, success be encouraged through other means. So it isn't just about um, humans working in cities. There is the other dynamic of how advanced robotics can survive in cities as well and work side by side. And we're already seeing that with drone deliveries and drone corridors in cities and how in the future we'll have driverless cars and all the things that go with it. So we have to embrace that and our cities have to become smarter to be able to adapt to the future that we are going to see. But some things that we're doing right now, and this is just an example I thought I'd show you, uh, you can see in the top left hand corner, there's St Paul's Cathedral and the red in the middle. We're repositioning uh, cities to encourage people to use the streets. So turning the streets over to parks, making them something where rather than having to go into retail units, the retail units are part of the streetscape. So it's a very, very different proposal. And, and it leads to vibrancy, uh, people feel more comfortable, and sure, you can say, yeah, great, that's the world very well in the summer, but we have to find ways to actually make it so it's okay in the winter as well. So heated streets, covered streets in some way, partially covered streets, but certainly the ability to cycle in the city, take cars out of the city is a fundamental requirement of how we'll get people back into uh, some sense of confidence. And then thinking more particularly about the buildings, this is a building with a tower that we designed in Hudson Yards in New York, and it works on the basis of a truly sustainable building. So the whole of the construction is timber frame, and it has a park at the top, but it has a park that runs right the way up the building. So you can see on the left there, that strip of park, it's completely open to the elements. So you don't have to go into the building at all to get to the very top of the building, which you see there as the park. And you can see how that works here. This is all the spaces. And then obviously you have a very, very large park at the top. And the key thing is here, people want access to fresh air. And I'll just end on this because it's fundamental that the responses that we have as um, architects, as people within the built environment will affect what happens in the future. So we have to do it now, we have to do it responsibly, and it will shape the way that we see the future emerging. Thank you very much. Big cities have always been the drivers of economic growth. But will it change after the pandemic? Uh, that's quite a wide ranging question. Um, I don't think so. Cities, cities will continue to exist, but they will have to adapt. And I think what we've seen with our cities at the moment is they are reliant on us getting confidence for people to go back to them. And we have to deal with the fundamentals that we find ourselves in right now. But without people in cities, they, they, they lack the vibrancy. And so it, it's a time period. I think this is a point in time. The city will adapt and it will re-emerge. They will remain the economic powerhouses of our society. People want to be with other people. This isn't a case of um, us all saying, right, okay, we're all gonna work from home now and stop at home and this is just the way we're doing it. Because what we're seeing is across the globe that that isn't typical of every country. Uh, some other countries are already, their cities are full again. So it's how we adapt to it. And I think the economic success of any country is reliant on the fact that you need density. So density in cities is a fundamental requirement to how you feel about being in one. Thank you, Darren. What means can provide security in public transport during the pandemic? So in, in the short term, that it is about reducing the numbers of people on them and passenger flows, getting them onto the public transport safely. So there's, there's where we're, what we're looking at, we're working with Transport for London 
um, and also the Civil Avi Aviation Authority uh, with the digital twin modelling to look at how you can restrict the flow of people down onto platforms so that you can socially distance for the time that we need to do this. Um, and to do that, we used a number of techniques, which is effectively we build a digital twin and we produce avatars that represent people and we can make them artificially sick and flow those pandemics through the spaces to see and study how quickly the, the infection rate would um, increase by having increased density or reduced density. So it, it's, it's very complex, clearly, but there are measures that, are, that can be done in terms of mathematical calculations to look at that. Then there's a the softer aspect, which clearly many cities are adopting, which we just have to get used to, and that is the wearing of face coverings and uh, hand sanitizers, all these sorts of things. But then also though, there are the technological requirements, uh, I believe we need to put in. So looking at nanotechnology, so that on handrails going down escalators, putting nanotechnology into that in terms of films or sprays or UV lighting to actually kill pathogens within spaces. So there isn't one, one single option, there's a range of options that have to be deployed and all of those have to be combined. And the clear thing is everyone is clearly talking my, I fundamentally believe that it's not the cost of, what, of doing it, it's the cost of what's the cost of not doing it. We have to restore confidence for people to travel and public transport so that they do come back into our cities. It is my pleasure to introduce Dmitry Lapirov from AECOM Russia. Dmitry, please share your screen. Mm -hmm. All right. I really hope that you can see my presentation. Uh, to be honest, I'm not an architect myself. Uh, I am an operations director for ACOM, for building, uh, for design department of ACOM here in Russia. I've got two design offices, one located in Moscow, another one in St. Petersburg. I am personally is based in St. Petersburg and uh, it happened so that one of the guys who had to take part in this conference, he was too busy and he asked me to, to prepare the presentation dedicated to the sustainable development of the cities in Russia. And it should be the development with British accent. Me personally, I was born here in Russia and I've got a Russian accent, so it, it's, uh, it was pretty complicated task for me to prepare this uh, presentation. But then I realized that I've got a background after uh, grading from the school uh, for several years. I worked as a guide, an English speaking guide in St. Petersburg, and probably it's uh, something that I can present to you, the British accent in Russian cities, but a historical background. And I'd like to speak about uh, one of um, actually most famous British architects working in Russia, uh, Cameron. Uh, not please, uh, not the Cameron who filmed Titanic, another one, Charles Cameron, uh, who worked in Russia at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And uh, it's interesting that he is actually the most known architect uh, from Britain because Almost all the rest were from Italy or France. And uh, Cameron is really famous for his uh, for design of the suburban palaces for Russian empress and empresses, especially for Saskia Cielo and for Pavlovsk. So, and... Uh, his father-in-law, uh, he, uh, he was one of the port 
guys working with uh, parks and uh, there is even a title of so-called the English parks, which uh, came, uh, they were more natural. Uh, they looked more like, a, you can see even like a forest comparing to the French parks with alleys, with bushes, all the cut and uh, so that was something new and something probably more sustainable for that time. And also, uh, Charles Cameron, he started art in Italy and he is known for his neoclassical works in, in suburbs of St. Petersburg and uh, probably one of the most famous uh, of his buildings is called Cameron's Gallery, so named after him. And of course, it's inter really interesting that Cameron's Gallery was constructed just close to the Catherine Palace, which is one of the best world-known Rococo palaces. So you can imagine that this neoclassical style, it was such a interesting task to build a new gallery in neoclassical style just close to Rococo, very uh, bright uh, Catherine Palace located in, in Sarske Silo. But in my view, he was pretty successful in this task because around the Cameron's gallery, uh, probably it's not uh, seen on the picture on the screen, but there is an English park around. So he is, as a guy coming actually from Scotland to Russia, he is really known for working in Russia, but his background, his uh, uh, years, about 10 years, he was an architect in Britain, but he is not famous for that. He's famous for his palaces, which he designed for Russia. And uh, it's, it was interesting to listen to the, uh, to the previous, to the previous speeches. And uh, Acom, has about 115 designers currently in Russia. And uh, I've got 55 designers based in St. Petersburg. And during the pandemic, of course, we had the lockdown and our office was closed and no one was allowed to work from the office. I opened the office here again, reopened the office on 6th of July. And I was so so surprised to find out that there is no line of those who really wish to return to the office. So I even had to prepare a presentation which is called the new normality and the world is changing and now there is no need to come to the office anymore. You can work remotely from whatever you want. For example, you can work directly from uh, the park located in Pushkin, just having your laptop and Wi-Fi connection, and that's it. So as I see, I run out of seven minutes I was given, and probably now it's the best time for any questions. So. Thank you very much. This time it's easier. We can ask questions in Russian. Well, it wasn't too hard before that as well. Anyhow, thank you very much, Dmitry. It's a great pleasure for us to see the familiar scenery, because I have lived in St. Petersburg for quite some time, and I visited one of the buildings which you showed right now, just recently. 
And of course there is a very popular question. Wesser has published a report on the future of cities after the pandemic. And it dedicates a lot of attention to green territories, green zones, their importance which has been highlighted in your report as well. We are not talking about walks and leisure time only, we are talking about working time as well. And I support this approach. In June and July I myself uh, was in a park holding meetings with our teams. And I would like to ask you, what is the requirement and the demands to the green spaces in this situation, for them not to be just leisure time locations, but to become the centers of social life of the whole communities? What I see on the greenery and green spaces and what we can see in Moscow in particular, we do not have borders right now. You're walking in the street and all of a sudden you enter some wonderful green space with a lot of greenery. Moscow is much stronger in this point than many places in Russia. And what I like is the absence of this barrier, both psychological and physical, between the park and the, the street. That is why the borders are disappearing both in streets and the parks, and uh, also the communication borders are disappearing. I do have this uh, division between Moscow and St. Petersburg offices. You're working on the Moscow project, you're working on St. Petersburg project. We don't have it anymore. Right now we are even closer than ever. Thank you very much for this wonderful reports and speech and discussion. We give floor to Karolina Skanechna from Gillespis. Gillespis, yes. Uh, Karolina, are you with us? Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you on the event today and, and have the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, my name is Karolina Skonieczna and I'm an associate at Gillespie's Landscape Architects. Uh, we are leading landscape designers with experience in the UK and internationally. And over the last 10 years, we've also worked in Russia. Uh, I think at the moment we've um, delivered around 50 projects all over Moscow and in Russia. My focus of today's presentation is how we integrate sustainable solutions into our daily practices at Gillespie's. So what do we know about the cities we live at the moment? Um, at the moment, more than half of world's population live in urban areas. And by 2050, we might expect even 70%, regardless of the pandemic. Um, so what is so attractive about our cities and spaces? Uh, we believe they provide a hub of social and cultural interaction. Um, they make memories. Um, they generate ideas that can continue to warrant investments. But uh, that said, cities are suffering. It's pollution, climate change, social inequality. And this year's pandemic has hugely increased the problem of uh, claustrophobia and stresses of the lockdown, uh, restricted access to nature and landscapes for many people around the world, and things we know are vital for well-being, the access to the nature. So what can landscape architects and urbanists do? We as landscape architects have the ability to really see the bigger picture uh, and understand the complex relationships between our cities, the people, and the natural environment. And we can really influence the relationships and make the sustainability happen. Um, it's integral to our approach. Landscape architects can really lead in transforming the quality of spaces in the cities. Alongside with other professions, like architects and engineers, we are committed to tackle these challenges with our designs. And um, the previous presentation showed how they do from the architecture engineering perspective. I'm going to show you how we can establish it as landscape architects. We are really passionate about sustainability. 
and we aspire to integrate it at every level uh, of our project development, not just as an after afterthought after the project has been completed. Over the next few slides, I'll show you how um, the different ways Gillespie is working to improve the sustainability credentially in, in, of our work. So to begin with, with site selection, at the early stage of planning, um, a strategy is drawn to maximize the site potential, even the most difficult sites. Uh, we look at the opportunities for walking and public transport to the sites, so that the better connectivity can be achieved for people and for the surrounding. Um, and we work with the sites that are neglected and very often forgotten, forgotten or even disconnected. Our work at Epsfleet, uh, this is an old quarry south of London, uh, has focused an area of post-industrial derelict site that will soon become a sustainable community. And the work on this project resulted in an overarching strategy for sustainable development elements feeding into the detailed design of the streets and spaces. Um, Gillespie's developed design processes, complex strategies and guidance for a range of street typologies, public squares and parks. Transportation, so something we touched on already this, this morning. Without planning and designing appropriate transport links, carriers will increase and this will have negative impact on the CO2 emissions. By design, Gillespie's role is to encourage and provide for healthy choices, so bicycles and pedestrians, and to open up more street space for people and activity. We also often act as an urban assessor in planning public transport. So here in Birmingham, in the UK, is currently implementing, in, in, implementing its tram system, bringing it back to life after over 70 years and Gillespie has provided design and advice of how the infrastructure could be best integrated into the streetscape to ensure the least impact. Materials. The use of, of high quality materials is always paramount for our designs. And here at the Welsh Assembly project, that was brilliant, rated excellent, uh, we uh, locally sourced Welsh stone and it was used throughout the design and transported a very short distance to the site. The design to use locally sourced materials is based around issues regarding availability, cost, quality and the local vernacular of the place. Water management, um, the use of planting, grass and other surfacing in landscape design is the natural way to control excess water and contribute towards the prevention of flooding. And here in Elephant Park in London, porous surfacing is used to car parks, street verges, and engineered drainage swales uh, to control water runoff uh, in creative and visually appealing way. But water management is also about green roofs and vertical greenery. Here at Google headquarters, in King's Cross in London, biodiverse ponds located on the extensive green roof will replicate the habitat surrounding. So the green roof and this urban site is densely developed, yet it extends city's green and blue network. Climate change issues are also forcing problems such as the urban heat island effect. Um, we work in the most extreme sites our work in Mazda City in Abu Dhabi. That was the world's first zero carbon and first zero waste development has involved detailed consideration of how a comfortable and inclusive public realm can be created in harsh climatic circumstances for the sustainable use of shelter, planting and water. Biodiversity. Preserving and encouraging biodiversity is particularly important for certain sites, especially those with unique or sensitive ecosystems. Here's an example. This is situated, situated on a former landfill site. Port Sunlight is a new waterside park near Manchester. It had a strong emphasis on access to nature from a big city, incorporating wildlife, wildlife habitats such as wetland area with a variety of plants and birds. 
Longevity and timelessness of our design has always been at the heart of our approach. The green spaces are often significant investments, therefore the schemes should be robust, flexible and easily adaptable to changing circumstances over time. And here at Southern on Sea, a historic green square has been adapted for modern needs with high quality materials that will last for many decades. But good landscapes are often more likely to be implemented when the client has the confidence they will be able to manage them sustainably in years to come. And here at the roof gardens of M7 offices, we have uh, designed a, um, a very resilient um, rooftop terrace with a robust palette of drought tolerant planting that requires minimum watering. So are self-sustained. Energy efficiency, this is one of our recent jobs uh, for the, the Forge, which, which will become the UK's first net zero carbon commercial building. And we are working close with architects to deliver that zero carbon framework and the associated landscape. But energy effic efficiency is also about sourcing planting for our schemes, sourcing them from local nurseries, and making sure that they're sustainable for climate and they can thrive and sustain with minimum maintenance and without the need for replacement. Finally, the whole life cycle costing. We believe that if schemes are built to a high standard, they will last longer and will require less ongoing maintenance than those where quality has been compromised. The practice um, recognizes the sustainability as the heart of our design, and we think about the economic and the social factor against the environment responsibility. So to summarize, uh, our cities are great, but they have to change. They have to allow for future resilience and flexibility, and they have to um, be healthy cities one that embraces nature and perhaps COVID-19 and the and the pandemic is a turning point a moment to reassess and make real positive moves to improve things in our cities so we need to remember to try and reconnect with the nature um, to prioritize places for people not for cars and finally to bring joy in the places that we share in the cities Thank you very much and welcome. Any questions? Carolina, thank you very much. Yes, I have a question. Uh, вопрос, вот, um, Russian cities are rather green, green, most of them, because we still have the greenery standards of the Soviet Union. And speaking of epidemiology and city sanitary measures, Soviet Union was rather progressive. That is why green zones enjoyed a lot of attention. Considering your experience of working in Russia, what would you recommend Russian cities right now from the point of view of uh, developing this green legacy? Um, uh, to develop the existing green uh, areas these days, I think is to make sure that they are as efficient and as um, easy to manage as possible. So, for example, at the approach to planting, we should try and steer away from the immaculate cut lawns every week or clipped hedges. We should try and explore options for planting that is more natural and harmony with the nature that can, can self-sustain self itself. And it's also easier for the city and the clients to manage those spaces. Also, I believe you are absolutely right that the balance of greenery from that Soviet Russian norms is, was very good. But now we have less space and more people in the cities and more cars. So how to make sure that we keep the balance and how to make sure that those spaces are also easy to adapt. So the park that maybe used to be a, only a representative park, how can we change it into a space for people? So actually 
in the times of pandemics and after that people can use the park in many ways for sport for recreation for for just simple relaxation so the flexibility ongoing um, adaptation is very important Мы тогда движемся дальше. Мы Мы движемся дальше. У нас еще один выступающий, Катерина Смирнова. From Brusnica. She will tell us about sustainable development in construction, shown by an example of the project which is being implemented by the company in two men. Good day, dear colleagues. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My presentation will be in Russian, unlike my colleagues' presentations. So, my topic is as follows. Sustainable development in construction, as shown by example of uh, Urban Villa in Tumin. My name is Ekaterina Smirnova. I represent the Brisnika company on the matters of sustainable development. I will speak a little bit about the company. Then, I will show the main ideas on the sustainable development and I will tell you why we've decided to choose Briam for certification and I will tell you about the urban villa, what we have done there and what results we achieved. Brusnika is the Russian development company founded in 2004 in two men. Right now our headquarters is located in Yekaterinburg and we are constructing all over Russia, including the Moscow region. We are in the top 5 rating of Forbes, the most reliable developers in Russia. The sustainable development term was introduced by the Brutland Committee in the 1987. It states that we need to fulfill the requirements of the existing generation without harming the future generation, and the main principles are formation of sustainable economy, distribution of resources and abilities evenly across the social sphere, and efficient distribution of resources in time. Based on these goals, the Sustainable Development Goals have been formed by the UN in 2015. There are 17 of those, but we have analyzed them and decided that the construction shows the four most efficiently. Third, good health and longevity. Nine, industrialization and innovations and infrastructure. Eleven, sustainable cities and uh, populated localities. And goal number 12. Working on our project, we have concluded that the most efficient method would be BRIAM, because we are aiming at European quality on the experience of our colleagues working in Europe, and also BRIAM is reflecting our internal values as well. The system was formed by the BRI Global Institute in the United Kingdom in 1990. If you take a look at the right part of the slide, you will see the diagram there. This diagram was created based on our analysis of the whole BRIM system. I'm talking about BRIM International only here about 15% of Russian regulations are reflecting the regulations of BRIM, the standards of BRIM. About 30% of the regulations of BRIM are reflecting the European Union standards, and about 50-55% are the development of uh, their institution and their own standards. Let me tell you why we chose the BRIM system. If you take a look to the right, in green you can see most important criteria for us, the energy consumption, well-being and ecology. Prostika is the developer which is building living quarters. That is why we are interested in microclimates inside the buildings and, of course, the environment outside our buildings. That is why we wanted to analyze the ecology and to reduce the energy consumption for our future residents. I would like to speak a little bit more about our case in Tumen. Urban Villa is located in the 5th Zarechny microregion of Tumen, 7th climatic zone. We have 32 apartments in our 
building. It's not mixed use, no retail, only living quarters. The area is about 800 square meters, and the building area is about 3,500 square meters. Technical solutions which we use there. As you can see in the slide, I'm talking about solar panels which are generating electricity, photogalvanic panels. We have installed chargers for electric vehicles, used the motion sensors in the community areas, perfected the surface of the building. Also, we monitor the energy consumption in the building, both in the apartments in the whole building. We have uh, used recuperation sets for ventilation and automated many processes in the building. Let me tell you about the technical solutions in details. First, the solar panels. We installed them on about 77 square meters of the roof, 30 degrees angle, oriented to the south. Maximum capacity is 370 watts, we have 30 panels like that. We have calculated that this station can provide lighting to public spaces and parking. The terms of return of investment is about 8 years. The next solution. Next, ventilation with recuperation. The principle is as follows. We let the fresh air from the street in, and we are not letting the extra heat out. We are not heating the street. We are conserving the heat within the building. The efficiency of such recuperators should be more than 85%. The solution, which we are considering right now, provide even higher efficiency, up to 95%. The next solution is nothing new for Great Britain, the charging stations for electric vehicles. It's not a novelty for two men as well, but we as a developer see it as a kind of innovation. Right now we are planning to install such stations everywhere, wherever we are constructing the buildings. We have the stations for adjacent territories and in the parking, both for the citizens and for those who are using this territory outside the building. The next surface. To the right we can see the standards and regulations, and to the left we see the project solutions. We can see that we have actually the non-transparent constructions are better by 40%. The insulation used to be 130 mm and right now it's 200 mm. Resistance of heat transference is 5.5 square meters Celsius per watt. The transparent constructions have been made better as well. We increase the heat transference resistance by 30%. And the area is 0 0.98 square meters. The next solution – monitoring of energy consumption. The idea is to monitor the consumption of particular apartments, but the building in full, to evaluate how efficient our building is. Of course, without the processes, Created during the design, this facility wouldn't be as efficient as we want it to be. We created the simulations of the heat model and uh, energy model, invited acoustics experts and uh, ecologists, created the map of uh, citizens' movement, and during the construction and the usage of the building, we would like to perform the separated garbage gathering. We will check the integrity of the building and, of course, the Bree is going to monitor the result and our evaluation team is going to do the same. I will show several studies which I personally consider to be most interesting. First, the modeling of the energy consumption. Why we did it? First, to understand how much energy is going to be consumed by our building, because we know that our standards are calculating everything with a lot of extra consumption. We wanted to understand the real consumption. Then, to evaluate the efficiency of the events which I described earlier. 
we saw that the overall coefficient of energy efficiency of the building will be about 0.7, which is a very high percentage, and we have decreased the demand for energy by the factor of 2. Then, heat modeling. We wanted to understand how comfortable our building would be without any additional engineering sets like a conditioning. And the results were amazing and they made us happy. We do not require air conditioning in our building. The index of unsatisfied is less than 10% and the temperature difference does not increase for degrees Celsius. This is great for Russia indeed. Next, acoustics. Of course, the main task was to understand how comfortable the apartments are, because we have various installations there, including the minus first floor, the technical floor, the vibrations from which shouldn't reach the apartments. We also made the constructions better, and it allowed us to reach the indicators 8 decibels better than the Russian standards. The result. Of course, getting the certificate is very important. It's wonderful. We are happy that we did. Although growth and increasing the quality of our products is most important for us, we used the European experience here and we would like to use it in all of our projects. We implemented innovative solutions and invited new specialists. For example, we used ecologists and acoustic specialists before, but not too often. We will work with such an approach and we will make even bigger research. We have received the intermediate certificate uh, from Bream International System. Scored excellent. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ekaterina. I have a little bit mercantile question. And the price for square meter in this building? What is it? Well, I cannot tell you what the number is specifically. However, I can say that it's a little bit higher than in neighboring urban villas. You can go to the Brustika website uh, and see the information there. Thank you very much. And during the construction and using of your technologies, what were the expenses to produce one square meter? I'm sorry, I am representing the economic area and that is why I would like to understand whether it can be really demanded by mass population because it is a great example from the point of view of living in the building and from the point of view of uh, conscious treatment of the resources by the citizens, the resources which we consume all the time. And we are not too responsible with those. Right now it's a little bit colder in Moscow at night and everybody started writing into the chat and asking to switch on the heating as fast as possible. We, the people from the Soviet time, even those who haven't lived there for too long, are still not used to counting the resources and when the technologies appear, the technologies which show it from the different angle, we can see other consumption patterns arise. So not uh, right away, but in some time. I am asking you about uh, the prices because I would like to model the whole picture, because I know the Russian real estate market in various regions, and I would like to understand how these products could be provided to the mass population and when. I cannot say that every solution that we used during this uh, project will be used in all of our projects. At least if we take a look at the solar panels, they are efficient in one region, while they are going to be a waste of money in the other region, because they don't bring any 
effects. We need to understand the requirements of each specific uh, facility in each specific project. If we're talking about other solutions, for example, the ventilation system with uh, recuperation, they are not as expensive as they seem, and it all depends on the manufacturer and the characteristics. And I would like to say that we would like to implement such solutions in most of our projects. And I cannot say that we are experiencing losses. This is the development project. It's uh, very important. We cannot uh, stand here on one place. We need to develop. We want to provide the quality product and we want the people who live in our houses to feel comfort and for them to understand the benefits. Because definitely when you are buying a flat, you are paying more but not too significantly, although they will save their resources in the long run when they are going to use this building during winter or, let's say, in autumn. You say it's colder in Moscow, it's colder here as well, and we want centralized heating on as well. That is why I do understand you. However, I would like to say that this is the development project and we wanted to include as many interesting solutions as possible to try them, to see how efficient they are going to be in our reality. The energy modeling showed that they are going to work rather efficiently. Whether it can be used in every facility, in every solution, it depends on time and the budget of each particular project. Thank you very much for your presentation, for answering our questions. Thank you. Then we will conclude. This is a very interesting case. And I hope that you would be able to provide this case to the mass population. I would like to express gratitude to our today's discussion. The department, thank you very much, Ekaterina, for gathering us here. Because I think that it's a very interesting dialogue indeed. Our esteemed representatives of uh, the companies have told a lot of interesting information about their cases and we have discussed both particular decisions and the overall topic of increasing sustainability of cities, including the Russian cities, using the solutions which can be used right now, which is significant and what we need to do in the future is to understand that uh, the economy shouldn't save money on construction, but uh, on the future usage. And especially if we're talking about the project Green Zones of Gillespie, we have seen it uh, there. Brusnika has demonstrated uh, their apartment building into men. This is a great example as well. And it's significant because the price for resources is increasing everywhere, both in Europe, the Great Britain and all over the world, and any resource is exhaustible. And the price of any utility resource is increasing all the time. That is why we are going to put it on our agenda on and on. Our wonderful companies like uh, Zahadid and uh, Brown Rig have showed great projects, which are using interesting architectural solutions and engineering solutions to be more secure even in such trying times as those we live in. They are not only decorating the cities in which they are appearing, but also they are complicated engineering constructions which help the cities to become more sustainable, to use maximum of their space, to become most efficient and most demanded, taking into consideration all the possible constraints.
Thank you very much for your speeches and presentations. Thank you to the Department for International Trade for gathering us here. Thank you very much, Natalia, for joining us during this expert dialogue. Our Department for International Trade is always ready to support British companies which are entering Russian markets and working here. And we are ready to support Russian companies to have a better dialogue with British specialists and experts. We will continue holding such events and we will be happy if you joined our live broadcasts as well as the offline broadcasts. Thank you very much for your attention.